Hey folks, this is Walt, and uh, with me today is a copious amount of knowledge that I could never touch uh, even with uh, the boots of striding. Uh, today we're talking about Doctor Strange, and we have a great roundtable to sit here and uh, give us our thoughts, give us their thoughts about the movie, and hopefully help me to talk. Uh, starting from my left to my right, we're going to go uh, across the pond with Mr. Aid Smith. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. And uh, we have next a doctor in his own right, Dr. Comics, Mr. Jason Tondro. How are you, sir? I'm good. Listen, if you need trouble learning how to talk, like you should get AIDS accent. Like, <laughs> how to, like teach you how to use the accent. That and... does not help you. Help at all. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> well, I, I always fall back on the fact that English is my second language, so all the stuttering <laughs> and stammering can be forgiven. Uh, and laughing at me in the background is Professor McGee, uh, Chris McLaughlin. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? I'm not sure yet. Um, I have a 30-pound uh, eating machine next to my leg who's looking both hungry and bored, so I'm kind of scared. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, last but certainly not least, making a special guest appearance. Um, and we really need to get like special credits for guys who you know uh, swoop in and steal the show. Uh, Mr. Steve Kenson, how are you, sir? Uh, very well, thanks. Thank you for coming on today. We appreciate it. So before the uh, before the green light went on and uh, you know everything said broadcast live on air, uh, uh, we were talking how um, uh, Marvel might have made the ultimate Green Lantern movie. So can we uh, can we talk about uh, everybody's thoughts about uh, initial impressions about the movie and uh, maybe a few insights, uh, starting with our special guest star, Mr. Steve? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, I I enjoyed the I enjoyed the movie a lot. Uh, it had the you know the first superhero movie tendency to retell the origin story which is you know pretty much you know the par for the course you know with with most new superhero movies uh, but did a pretty good take on it and um i think you know really grabbed onto the compelling elements of dr strange's origin um and spun them out into a pretty good story. Uh, I've, I've heard that uh, it's been said that the plot of the movie is a little thin, and uh, I agree that it's it's not a an overly complex story so far as it goes, but, you know, this is something that, you know, essentially Stan Lee told in, like, eight pages. So, yeah. um, you know, the fact that they spun it out into a two-hour movie, uh, they they didn't have a whole lot to work with to begin with, so I think they did a pretty good job with that, all things considered. Anything uh, for you that uh, that stood out as uh, like a whoa moment? Um, I liked uh, I liked that it was funny. Actually, um, you know that it it had a it had a good sense of humor about things that was that was both sort of dry and a little slapstick uh, in spots. Um, that that was nice because uh, you know they, it clearly wasn't taking things too seriously. Um, the fact that it was a uh, you know a, a you know a comic book movie, you know, came through. And in spite of the you know sort of high stakes drama of you know protecting reality from you know terrible eldritch threats, you know it it had some it had some humor to it, and I, I kind of I really liked that. Right on. Uh, Professor McG, yes. uh, thoughts and impressions about the film? I thought it was fairly good. Uh, I'll, I'll lay my cards on the table. Uh, Doctor Strange has just been one of those Marvel characters that has never really worked for me. Uh, I, I think my friend Jim Pinto said it best that, you know, Doctor Strange just seems like such a weird fit for a Marvel universe that's largely built on a New York City that's so real you can smell the garbage strikes. And so, uh, but uh, so he's never been my favorite Marvel character, but the, but I, you know, I, I took a chance on this movie and it was a lot better than I expected. Honestly, I, I think it's a come down from civil war. I don't think it's as good as guardians of the galaxy. Don't think it's quite as good as Ant-Man, but the parts of it that worked really, 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 really worked well. Uh, I think my favorite thing about it is I love about how these ostensibly comic book movies pay for top-notch actors. I mean, there was a moment where uh, during uh, Tilda Swinton's dying scene, 
Yeah. That I was sitting there thinking, you know, whatever else I got, I got to see a movie with Benedict Cumberbatch and Tilda Swinton. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that that's that's kind of a privilege for a movie fan to see two great actors just doing their thing, regardless of the fact that it's based on a comic book or not. Mm. So I appreciated the the quality of the acting uh, pretty much throughout. And I like how, the, especially since Civil War, they have found a way to talk about serious issues without without feeling like, you know, it's an Aaron Sorkin thing where the author is standing atop your chest, screaming down at you. And I love about how they made a movie about faith and, 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 and belief and wanting and, and, you know, how much better we are, how much fuller we are when we believe something beyond the fact that we're mere specks in an uncaring universe. And I, I really, really appreciated that aspect of it tremendously. I mean, goodness knows. I mean, you know, I, I think the I think the greatest thing about human experience is when we're uh, exposed to a diversity of ideas and thoughts. And if it's one thing about modern popular culture it, that really just I'm so done with it, just it seems to be this unrelenting font of negativity about spirituality and belief. And to me, this was just, I mean, this was like a trip to the oasis to find any film that had anything good to say about a larger sense of belief. So I really appreciated that aspect of it. Uh, the parts that didn't work for me is I've never been a big fantasy guy. I don't have the fantasy gene. How I made it in the role-playing industry seems to have been a mistake somehow, <laughs> like a paperwork error. And I, the thing that, about fantasy that's never worked for me is it's just, you know, it's just one long deus ex machina. You know, what inexplicable thing that hasn't happened before is going to come along and save the day? You know, there's no rules here, so something's going to happen, and that's going to resolve the story. And I think after, like, the third hour of buildings shifting around in random directions while the play, while, while uh, players, <laughs> there you go, so it shows my orientation, while the, the main characters were running away from it, you know, that got a little old for me, especially in 2D. But, you know, I just the acting and the, and the humor, like Steve said, and the fact that I think that it had a good it had a good message about something other than just comic book stuff. I, I, I that that part of it really worked for me. And I'm I'm in for the I'm in for the sequel. I'm in to see where this goes. And again, a character I don't know a single comic book for. So well done, Marvel. Keep them coming. Nice. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jason, uh, thoughts and impressions of. The I think we have to let Aid give his ritual disclaimer first. <laughs> What did you think what? of the movie? I didn't see the. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no, watch Marvel really movies. Because you actually, that's not, okay. That's not strictly true. I do watch <laughs> Marvel movies now because I have actually seen Guardians of the Galaxy not long ago. But that's as far as I've got now. Okay. Well, <laughs> anything else? You I will like this movie. Page, when you see it. Um. Mm. Well, I, I like the mm. film. Um. I um. Uh, I'm I'm sort of the opposite of Chris. Uh, I've been a huge die, uh, diehard Doctor Strange fan ever since I was a kid, and it was precisely because of the magic in the book that that immediately drew me uh, to it because I was sort of nursed on Lord of the Rings, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, and so I, I enjoyed the film. I took some of my students to see it. I'm teaching a film class right now, and we're spending uh, we're doing a, a four week sequence on the superhero uh, to finish off the semester. Ooh. Has the privilege of being a super, being a, a professor as you get to pick your own books, which is awesome. <laughs> so, um, so we're gonna we're watching the original Superman and um, and Unbreakable and and Civil War, uh, but we're also watching this film. Um, and, and and I did like it. Now it, it wasn't without to me it wasn't without some rough edges and some stuff that I had a few mm. problems with. Um, I, everyone's talked about the humor in the movie, and I'm glad that the movie was funny. But I am not yet used to Doctor Strange being funny. <laughs> like that particular aspect of the character, uh, and Cumberbatch, you know, was clearly relishing it. I mean, he, he, he <laughs> loves the sort of deadpan humor and the the little the kind of relatively quiet jokes that he sort of throws out there and checks to see if Wong laughs. You know, and I and I get that, and that and that was that was entertaining, but it was a bit of jarring for me because I'm not used to Doctor Strange being like in tune with the seventies music and dancing in the operating room. And like, you know, and, and I get why it was seventies music because Dr. Strange is very trippy. And there were some seventies album covers that homage Dr. Strange. And like, there's a mm -hmm. connection there and that's kind of an Easter egg. And I, I get that. Mm -hmm. Um, but what, but for me, what really worked and what I thought made the movie interesting, regardless of who was in it and like it, the rest of the movie could suck. And I would still have found it interesting <laughs> was the ending. Uh, mm -hmm. because th this, this, 
this is the first Marvel movie I can think of where the solution was not punch the guy just like you harder until the movie <laughs> ends. And, and, and this is presaged early in the film when there's a quick exchange between Mordo and Strange. And Mordo's like, we got to get in there and kill him, you know? And Strange is like, no, like, there must be another way. Like, let's just mm -hmm. think about this for a minute. And mm -hmm. I was like, whoa. And, you know, and that, that was Chekhov's anti-gun on the anti-mantle piece, you know? <laughs> and, and so I waited for the gun to not be fired. And sure enough, at the very end, um, mm. you know, he, he plays this trick. And, and, and what, I, what I loved about the ending was it was a straight-up Doctor Who ending. <laughs> right? and, I mean, every time that Strange goes and lands on the asteroid and says, Dormammu, I'm here to bargain, he may as well have been walking out of a blue telephone box. <laughs> and it also reminded me, and Chris can rem remember this, um, a famous episode of the first first season of Star Trek when Lazarus gets locked in a time oh, tunnel with his God. evil self from another dimension. <clears throat> yeah. What's it called? The Armageddon? The Armageddon factor. factor. Yeah. The, oh, the alternative factors. Alternative yeah. factor. That was it. The alternative factor. And, uh, and a very similar thing happens in that episode where the guy is like, Lazarus like, well, I'll keep him busy forever if I have to. But of course it ends by the, the Enterprise blowing everything up because that's what the Enterprise does. Hmm. Uh, and so I, I really liked it. And, and I, thought, I thought it was great to see a resolution where the solution was not just beating the guy up really hard. And I, I liked it because it was, to me, a very obvious Doctor Who call out. <laughs> and, and, and I think that that's because Marvel is trying to reach out to those fans. Now, mm -hmm. Benedict Cumberbatch has never played the Doctor, but everybody that watches the Doctor watches Sherlock and they, and they get him from there, you know? It was also a fairly deft adaptation of Doctor Strange's first comic book encounter with Dormammu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although he, although he doesn't defeat him in exactly the same way mm -hmm. in comics, it is essentially a similar scenario where he tricks Dormammu yeah. uh, and Dormammu has to, you know, mm -hmm. essentially uh, swear to, you know, not invade Earth. You know, yeah. he, he owes Doctor Strange a debt. Yeah. The big, the big change... That, that, that involved the silent ones. Like, doesn't he save uh, the mindless ones? Yeah, the mindless ones. Did he save a from the mindless ones? Yeah. Yep. yeah. And we see the mindless ones at the very end. I don't know if I yes. I think they're talk. they're setting up for that. Yeah. When when Mordo when uh, uh Caecilius and his goons go flying in, mm -hmm. this guy they turn into mindless ones. Yeah. But uh, the 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 other thing that really messed with the plot. This is the one part that Aid won't like. <laughs> because they messed with the comics, is that they made the Orb of Agamotto into the time gem. Mm. Right? So it's got time control powers. And and they did it smoothly, and I get why they did it, because they had to link it in. Yep. But I was really only disappointed by one thing in this movie, and that's that the eye of Agamotto did not open up, float onto Doctor Strange's forehead, and become his third eye. Mm. Which was always the cool, like the creepiest <laughs> little, I love that bit from the comics. Uh, but but I, I liked it, and I was very pleased with the ending, that it was a non-violent conflict resolution. Yeah. Uh, and, but I think that a lot of people are going to feel like the, like the film let them down. Like it was anticlimactic. Excuse my dog speaking in the background. He's <laughs> got me for, for all day long, he doesn't use this toy, but as soon as we start to talk, you know, <laughs> I'll shut up now and let somebody else take it away from Otis. You know, you, you reminded me of something else that I loved about this film, about that film. It, it's not, it's a, it, it's a relatively brief scene, but the moment where Strange is obviously emotionally distraught and overcome by having had to take a life, even in self-defense, mm -hmm. being true to that character and being true to him as a doctor. That's right. And it was a great scene and, and, and you know, metatextually kind of a nice middle finger to what DC continues to crap into theaters. Did somebody, because, pointed out, somebody made this claim on Facebook. And of course that means it must be true, but <laughs> is this the first Marvel movie where there is no gun in the entire picture? Uh, it may, I, it as well far be. as I know. Yeah. And what, I mean, even four, you know, like we occasionally see guys with guns. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did like I did like that moment. And you somebody you mentioned um the the Tilda Swindon um Cumberbatch death scene. Yeah. A a great scene because it shows humility. I mean yes. Tilda Swindon looks at the camera and says, It's not about you. <laughs> right. What what a great message for a movie, you know? Yeah. And and then when she dies, we're not we don't even see it. Yeah. Like it's a death scene that we don't even see, and, yeah. and I, I thought that was gutsy. It's still not on my record as best death scene in a Marvel movie, but it's definitely number two. 
you know, it's played well. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you another thing that 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 I, that I really appreciated about the movie is, um, if you go back, it's been a while since I've read Strange's origin, but to the best of my memory, it's a typical 60s comic book story where he's a surgeon, he is in the car accident, he goes to the East, and like three panels later, he's the greatest sorcerer that has ever lived. Well, I, 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 li I like the fact that early on they establish that Stephen Strange has a photographic memory. Yeah, mm -hmm. which makes it a little. I mean, I mean, it, I mean, every ounce of it, it, credibility you can cram into a comic <laughs> movie, I think it's better. It makes it a better film, and yeah. that that to me uh, that that increased my buy-in that this guy could get so good so quickly. Yeah, and looking at the film, and it it may have hurt some of the action sequences. The number of things that he's actually able to accomplish mystically is fairly limited. It is. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that that increased my buy-in much more so than a typical Doctor Strange story. Yeah. 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 No crimson bands of Kid Iraq, no flames of the fall team, none of that crap. Yeah, it's like it's like they're actually mindful that there's going to be another movie, and maybe you should save something for that. Yeah. And uh, speaking of the sequel, I mean, okay, so feel we should we should pre grief for Wong now. <laughs> yeah. He's not gonna die, but we've set up the bad guy now as having the power to strip magic from people. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Wong isn't a sorcerer in the comics anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he clearly got powers just so that they could take him away in the second movie. Yeah. And he'll just be wrong again. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's fairly safe to say that, you know, uh, Strange will be one of the only remaining sorcerers yeah. by the end of the second movie. Yeah. And hey, kudos to coming up with a way more interesting version of Mordo than the comics have ever had. Mm -hmm. I mean, comic book, mo com I mean, comic book Mordo, I was explaining to my wife on the way out of the theater, comic book Mordo's superpower is he's a whiner. <laughs> yeah. You know, wow, major upgrade on on the movie version of that character. Yeah. Well, you know, you cast a great actor and then you write you write a part that he can bring life to, you know. Oh yeah. I yeah. mean just well, you know that, that I mean that's that's the continuing joy of these movies is the actors that they somehow convince to be in them and just uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And the key thing they gave Mordo was motor was motivation. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the comic book version has never really had anything other than the fact that he was evil um, going for him, you know, or power hungry, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, but, you know, the, the cinematic version of Mordo has that very central sort of sense of betrayal and yeah. lost his faith. You, li you lied to me. Right. Yeah. Everything I believed in was a lie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have to admit the film scared me a bit, making me think that like, oh god, is Cassilius going to be a guy who's evil because he's evil? But right. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad they at least took a minute to give him some motivation, other than, well, the film needs a bad guy. Yeah. yeah. The, the, now you were talking about Strange's origin, and there is a fairly, uh, to me, it seems significant change mm -hmm. in the origin in terms of Strange's motivation and his character mm -hmm. in the original comic. Strange was a surgeon, like you noted, Chris, but he was, yeah. his problem was that he, was, he wanted wealth. Mm -hmm. like he wouldn't operate on a patient unless they could pay his exorbitant fee. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. was a symptom of his pride, and it was his ego. But they mm -hmm. made a point in the comic of him basically saying, like, you know, he, he, he values wealth. But in the film, they swapped that to fame. Yeah. He, he wouldn't operate on people because that wouldn't bring him any fame unless they had an unusual condition. Mm -hmm. He would be famous for fixing. It wasn't worth his time. Mm -hmm. And I see why they did that. It fits into the larger plot about the quest for immortality. And it seems more relatable. It, it does. And also, the, we saw money in Iron Man all we have. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so, so we have to distinguish him from Iron Man since they already have the facial hair. And they, and <laughs> right. How do we make friends? Yeah. So, uh, but Strange's desire to be famous to be immortal before he even becomes a sorcerer makes him a great parallel to Caecilius mm -hmm. who, who wants his own form of immortality and is just duped into it in much the same way that, that, that Strange dupes himself into it. Mm -hmm. Well, and Caecilius tries to appeal to Strange's whole notion of doctors as the enemies of death. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, who wouldn't, you know, as a physician want the power to, to give people the ability to live forever? Nice yeah. little scene there. Yeah, it was. Now, what, what do you guys, what guys think, think about of, uh, the romantic subplot? Mm, honestly, I thought it was it was one of the weakest parts of the film. Yeah, it really did seem tacked on. I, I mean, I think it's significant that it didn't resolve. 
I mean, it just, yes. yeah. they're not, they're not a couple. Like, and, yeah, and it, yeah. it did resolve, it resolved unsuccessfully. Yeah. I actually did like the fact that it, it ended up essentially not being a romantic. Yes. Mm. Uh, because that leaves room for Clea. And let's be honest. <laughs> We're all waiting for, I'm waiting for Clea. <laughs> What did you guys think of uh, the astral scenes, the scenes, um, especially the fight scene that uh, involves, uh, you know, his paramour? Uh, made me sad. I had to watch that in the non two in the non three D version of <laughs> that I saw it. I would, uh, yeah. but I'm yeah, really glad. Wild they, 3D. Really glad that they included because the the whole astral projection thing is such a, a, a you know a key element of of the Doctor Strange mythos yes. and mm -hmm. the character's sort of visual appeal. I'm really glad they they both included it and, and I think did did it reasonably well. And, and yeah. it, I think it was very influential, you know, Strange's astral form. Like it seems like every wizard can do that now, and mm -hmm. and it it's kind of all goes back to Strange and Ditko. We have to give credit yeah. where credit is due. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that the dark dimension looked like a Ditko panel. Right. <laughs> with with the, the bridges connected by spheres of whatever. Yeah. I, I was I was. Uh, only surprised that I didn't see a giant open gaping mouth. You know? Mouth, right? <laughs> big, big staring eye. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought that I was cool. Yeah, I, I thought, thought they similarly did a really good visual version of Dormammu. Yeah, um, you know that, isn't that an interesting challenge. Like I'm but, pretty sure that the stripes on Dormammu's head was originally just supposed to represent the fact that his head's on fire. Right. Can't see his features. Yeah. But yeah. that's what it was originally just supposed to represent. But now he's like actually got like a sort of bony ridge face. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that they made his face so sort of spatially distorted um, in the dark dimension scenes kind of covered his whole weird cactus head effect. <laughs> yeah. You know, that actually made it kind of fit. Yeah. And I guess that was Cumberbatch doing the, the body acting for Dormammu. Oh, oh really? Huh. That's cool. I guess he pitched that on the set. He was like, well, Maybe I could do that. And they thought about <laughs> it for a day or two, and he said, sure. So, yeah. He's done a lot of motion capture since Hobbit and stuff like that. So, mm. oh, that's I'm why wondering, I did, uh, yeah. did they base uh, Dormammu's features on uh, Sahuaro from Icons? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of that. That would be uh, an interesting, interesting use of the time stone <laughs> right there. <laughs> um, uh, what did you guys think of uh, of um, Doctor Strange consistently and constantly wanting to be referred as Doctor? Um, well, as a guy as a guy that never misses an opportunity to call himself Professor McGee, that really resonated with me utterly. That made me fall totally in love with the character. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I don't know anybody who has a doctorate who doesn't take the opportunity to. You know, <laughs> It's Drop not Mr. Somewhere. Strange or Master Strange. It's right. Strange. And the whole conversation, oh, so you're Mr. Doctor. I'm oh. telling you, it was a Doctor <laughs> Who call out. It was, mm -hmm. you know, everybody that watches Doctor yeah. Who laughed in that scene. Yeah, I'm actually surprised they didn't have the opportunity to drop in the line, Doctor Who, somewhere. Yeah. Totally. yeah. And, and you know, it's it, it's funny. I would have to go back and watch it for a second and a half time, but it's kind of funny that you know, in the beginning, he's insisting upon it because he's still such a prideful guy. Yeah. And towards the end, when he's correcting people like Cassilius, in a way, he's rebelling against the fact that they're trying to make him something other than what he is and what his mm -hmm. core values and principles are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's asserting his identity. Yeah. yeah his values. Uh, I agree. All right, so who wants uh, the striding boots? And let's, we got to talk about the cloak. <laughs> oh, I know, right? I love the cloak so it, much. It was a little bit too much like the flying carpet of Aladdin for me. Yeah. See, I kind of like the that the cloak was sort of his wacky sidekick. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Are they, it, was uh, it was, it was really funny. Uh, yeah, but uh, that, um, that scene where the cloak is basically battling him for dominance, like, no, you need to go this way because this is the tool you need. <laughs> um, um, what did you guys think about that that suspension harness that that uh, captured Caecilius that well, led to that great scene? Example of exactly what Chris was talking about, which is the Deo Ex Machina thing. Like, right? Yeah. Like, well, we're gonna. It just so happens we have a perfect device for containing the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. Hanging on the wall, you just can't see it because you're a dope. 
Yeah. It also made me think I'd logged on to the wrong website, you know, so that I was going to trip <laughs> off the web filter there. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's okay. going to safe word here in a minute. I, I, I don't know if I should be watching this. <laughs> some, some of that also connects into, you know, what, um, you know, um, Chris was saying earlier about how they, they sort of deliberately limited Strange's arsenal, That's right. um, you know, because any other scene in the comics, you know, Caecilius would have been bound up in the Crimson Bands, Yes. And, you know, that's how Strange would have trapped him. Yeah. Um, but they obviously didn't want to go that route in the, the story because of Strange's relatively limited sorceress abilities. Yes. And so they had to introduce some kind of, of tool that was going to accomplish that. Instead, yeah, the, the whole yeah. it, it, it was just it was just it was just kind of missing the scene where Dumbledore hands it to him, you know? Yeah, yeah. I I, I could have done without the whole sling ring thing. Yeah, yeah, me too. But again, it's it's another plot device because it's something that can be taken away from. Yes, them. yes, and I I get that. Yeah, like well, we've got a hero who can teleport from one dimension to another. We, it's that's going to ruin all of our stories unless we have a way to stop him from doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, and it gets to be, you know, unlike the Marvel comics of the 70s, only so many times you can hit Doctor Strange in the head with a rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, it was nice, though, to see, like, the various artifacts show up when mm -hmm. when Wong pulls out the Wand of our tomb. You know, I was I was so there. Yeah. yeah. So did anybody get uh, that the, um, the defender of the um, New York Sanctum who Caecilius kills is Jericho Drum? Oh no. no. Yeah. Oh no, I didn't get that. Who <laughs> will uh, conveniently now be dead for his psychiatrist brother to come and avenge him? <laughs> oh so okay, so it's not brother No, it's, well, it's not, not Jericho, brother. it's actually Jericho's brother. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I hope somebody told Fred Hembeck. That, that that's a long setup. Like uh, right. you know what? he should show up in if, if if there was justice in this world, or, or more justice, <laughs> right. he would show up in one of the Netflix shows. Yep. Yeah. Like, let's see Brother Voodoo in the next Luke Cage, like Luke Cage season two. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. I'd be so down with that. <laughs> yeah. There's, <laughs> there's, there's very little crossover, it seems like, right now between them. Yeah. Well, it's all one way. It's all yeah. like the television show can ape the movies. Yeah. But right, but not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've been uh, rumors of a Ghost Rider show coming out. Yeah, what? apparently they're kind of the yeah. the whole Shield thing is sort of a backdoor pilot. And and there's also just announced this last week that the Inhumans is now a TV series instead of a movie. Really? Right. But but is going to premiere in theaters. Oh wow! Yeah, they're going to do it on uh, IMAX, aren't they? Yep. Well, Great. if they give if they give me Medusa, I will forgive them all. Yeah. It's supposed to be the. It's supposed to be focused on the the inhuman royal family. So, mm. well, well, Karnak's gotten a lot of play lately. Are any of you yeah. reading his book? Yeah, it's been an interesting development. Mm. Mm. I saw that and said, "I saw that and said, wow, teleporting bulldog.' Marvel must have got my comment card." <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lockjaw. For, uh, for what it's worth, Chris, um, uh, Lockjaw is a major character in Ms. Marvel. Oh, yeah, that's excellent. true. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, Ms. That's, that's, that's Ms. She, uh, Ms. Marvel was assigned Lockjaw by Medusa to keep an eye on her. <laughs> oh, God. And, and, and so that's her dog. Because, you know, girls love dogs. Like, who doesn't right? love dogs? Yeah, Lockjaw's great. Oh, well, my, we have six of them in my house thanks to my wife. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God! I thought I had a busy life with 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 two. <laughs> well, to be fair, yours is as a hyperactive carpet eating German Shepherd. Oh my God! Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Which we we shouldn't have named him what we named him, but you know, we always talk about it. Um, so we're, we're talking guys, about. Uh, can you guys see that giant hole in my eye? <laughs> That's that's Otis right there. Like every day he eats another piece of it, and I duct tape it up, and he. Eats <laughs> <laughs> he probably thinks it's the game or that. It is. Like, oh, it has totally back. become a game exactly. at this point. <laughs> Except I'm losing. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been we've been talking movie uh, the whole time. Uh, Aid is, is seeing that uh, you've been kind of quiet for a little while. Um, <laughs> heard a lot of uh, what we've been talking about, like some of the plot elements and some of the design he, and story elements. Uh, how does it? Uh, movies, he wouldn't have to be quiet. 
<laughs> how does that uh, how does that line up with some of the comics that you've read? The, what, the series now or the original uh, stuff? Uh, some of the original stuff, and then throughout, uh, you know, you throughout the different Dr- series. Doctor Dr. Strange was one of his characters. Like I, I never really read anything consistent, but he, I don't think he had a really he had a cool book for quite some time. Uh, I know I read uh, the Jackson Grease stuff back when Clear was in it, and I read mm-hmm. Strange Tales when they had the Cloak and Dagger back up. Yep. And I'm getting the, the backlow one at the moment, which is very, very good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I was, more, I was quite interested to know what, like, the the that the bad guy in the movie, whatever his name is, Cassilius, did you say? Yes. Mm-hmm. Is he a good bad guy? Because judging by the trailer I've seen of it, they're selling him as like, this is the big bad guy. Forget the guy with the flaming head. He's not going to show up. This is the <laughs> bad guy. Th- does he justify everyone thinking that, you know, a, a, a general public that do not know the man who's going to show up, that he is a good enough bad guy? Or is he kind of just like insignificant, you know, guy that's going to get you know knocked over every two seconds? Well, he's not. I'm sorry. Well, he's not Magneto, but they no. at least, but he works better than say Ronan the Accuser did in Guardians. They actually right. get, put a little more effort into developing why he's doing what he does, and they come up with a fairly interesting reason for why he does what he does. Okay, and, and the fact that Mads Mikkelsen was playing him, you know, mm-hmm. but they, do. but they, they have wasted great actors on crappy villains. I mean, I, I, I still have, I still can't quite believe Christopher Eccleston was anywhere in the Thor sequel. Yeah, he was wearing so much makeup nobody could recognize him. Or that Oscar Isaac was in one of the recent misbegotten X Men films. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, I think Caecilius works overall, and they they at least do give him uh, some motivation. But um, yeah, I mean, he he's interesting. I think in that he he comes across as more of a threat than he otherwise would because, again, we start out with Strange not being Sorcerer Supreme. Mm-hmm. And so Kaecilius is scary because he's so much more powerful as a sorcerer, at least in the beginning. Yeah. You know, um, back when, when Busek started to write Avengers, he wrote the first story arc and the villain was Morgan Le Fay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of fans wrote in and said, "Why did you pick such a cheesy, like zero string Marvel villain? <laughs> and why wasn't it Loki, or why wasn't it Kang, or so on?" And he said, "Well, because the point wasn't the villain. Mm-hmm. The point was getting the team together. And if I if I'd done a big villain like that, it would have been a Loki story or a, a, a mm-hmm. Kang story." Right. And I think we kind of saw that with Caecilius. I think this was wise, honestly. I, I, I was tired of heroes fighting villains who, who are just like them. And this goes mm-hmm. all the way back to Iron Monger. Who, who, um, who played Iron Monger in the Jeff Bridges? Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges. This is an example of, of, in my opinion, like wasting a great, a great actor. He had some pretty good lines. I don't, and, and Jeff Bridges had a pretty good part in that movie. Mm-hmm. But as soon as he put on a, a, a metal helmet over his head, I mean, I, you know, I, I couldn't see him anymore, and I, yeah, they lost me. Uh, and and so, Caecilius is not Strange's arch enemy. No, his arch enemy is going to be Mordo. <laughs> yeah, and we spent all movies setting up Mordo. And and one last note, Chris, you said you know the third hour of buildings folding in on themselves. Yeah, this movie is surprisingly short. It's only an hour and forty, which for a Marvel film is weird. Yeah, and the, but, but mm-hmm. the the buildings folding was the only time I really felt time passing. Oh, I, I agree. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree. They they played on on a, on that particular instrument quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's, here's another question for you then, as somebody that's not seen it. Magic in the in the cinematic universe is it now something that's going to be brought up more and more, or is it something that they're trying to limit? So that they can't say, well, someone can just cast a spell and get rid of the next civil war or something like well, that. Well, actually, thought they handled that well. Well, the, the thing to remember is, is that quite frankly, Doc, as as Steve noted, Strange can't do all that. Like he he can't do that much. He can make energy things physical. You know, he can like make an energy whip or make an energy shield or something, and he can teleport from one place or one dimension to another. He, and and he can control time with the eye. And that's kind of it, right? Mm-hmm. At the so moment. far. 
but yeah, and, but is that yeah, is that good enough? Because it's like I say, you can't. If, everyone, some people are going to get start getting annoyed if he's sorcerer supreme, and the best we can do is pull a bunch of flowers out of a hat. He's not. I mean, eventually, <laughs> they, they make a point about that that the sorcerer supreme was the ancient one, and she dies in the movie, and no one is able to replace her. So right. the movie yeah. ends with Strange still very much like not sorcerer supreme, mm -hmm. which which is great because it actually copies the comics where he wasn't. Source yeah. Supreme for a long time. He was just Doctor Strange, Master of Black Magic. Right? Yeah, right. yeah. This is the, subtitle. Yeah, you get a real sense that this is just Sorcerer's Stone. It's not Deathly Hallows. Just yes, yet. exactly. Yeah. And and and, uh, and to, to get back to uh, your question, Aid, like, well, maybe this the, the Ancient One could have could have solved all of these problems, but she's dead now, and so we don't have. There's no Deo Ex Machina. I think they mm -hmm. killed that person. Uh, yeah. On the major scale. And the second way that they handled it, and this may have been what, what Steve was getting at, is that Strange's spe specific task is to protect Earth from extra-dimensional threats. And so if it's not an extra-dimensional threat, he has full grounds to say, well, let's let the Avengers handle that one. Right. I'm kind of, my dance card's kind of full. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is always his excuse in, in, in comics as well. Like, yeah. well... You know, fans would write and say, well, how come Dr. Reed doesn't just show up and solve this problem? Like, well, because he's off in the dark dimension, this issue. Haven't you been reading? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus the other rather clever touch I thought they added to the, the cinematic version of Dr. Strange was the whole notion of the mirror dimension. Is that in the comics? Is the mirror it's dimension? It's not. You know, um, you know they, they use the astral plane for that a lot in the comics. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, the nice element of the mirror dimension is that it essentially looks exactly like our world yeah and it's where all of this weird wacky magical stuff can happen you know and the sorcerers can have these giant magical battles in the middle yeah. of manhattan and no one else can see it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah now, ordinarily the, they would have done that with oh, sorry. Casting the spell of invisibility right so that mm -hmm. no one right yeah. right I'm yeah, sorry. oftentimes they would have strange you know erase people's memories or <laughs> things like that but then the mirror yeah. dimension kind of falls into that category but it's another one of those nice plot devices about yeah why all this magic stays secret mm -hmm. yes a friend of mine explained it as like the plane of shadow in D D, &D or, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, play, or possibly something like changing the uh changeling the dreaming where i think kind of nobody can see it but it mm -hmm. happens so yeah mm. interesting yeah yeah, if you don't mind me throwing in a little personal observation about about this film, since we're sort of talking about gaming, uh, I had a really, really, really happy thought as I, as 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 I was waiting for the for yet another post credit scene to finally show up. Uh, I, watching this film, I I was immediately taken back to when I was gosh, I guess sixteen years old, and the magic day the UPS guy brought me the book of magic supplement for the old Phaser Rip Marvel superheroes game. Realms of magic. And, and oh yes, yeah, thank you. That and, was such genius. God, I love that. And, and flipping through that and seeing how some insane person had looked up every single spell that mm -hmm. Strange had, all the magic items. Yes. And I remember. The, and I remember Alan Varney. Yes. And I remember reading that book and thinking, wouldn't it be great to someday? I'm 16 year old me was thinking, wouldn't it be great someday to have a friend who thinks this is cool as I do? <laughs> and it finally hit me and it finally hit me. Hey, you, you have people like Steve Kenson in your life that, <laughs> that, 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 that lost their mind when they got this book too. Yeah. And it just made me so happy that, you know, I, you know, that my, my, the dream of my younger years has come true. I know people that, that love this stuff as much as I do. Well, and so you got to do with, you got to do with toy man's to uh, top, the tops tops. Yes. With, with the, those <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Channeling my Alan Var inner Alan Varney. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. I remember all of those spells, and they found every single spell that he'd ever cast in the books, and <laughs> yep. the, the black bands of Bellaro and all of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was good stuff. Well, you know, and one of the the great boons of you know uh, the new Marvel movie is, of course, now Marvel is motivated to put out all of the great Doctor Strange collections. Yes, uh, yeah. and you know, they're all becoming available again. Yeah, uh, exactly. So this is, what, this is you, always a side benefit it, for me. As someone who likes the comics more than the movies, this was like yeah. hey, it's mm -hmm. print time. And, and, and I, if if anyone out there you know has an urge, like I went on, I went on um, Marvel Unlimited, you know their digital yeah. service, and yeah. I read every single one of the Steve Ditko Doctor Stranges. Yep. Wow. It's, he was only on the he was only on the series for a couple of years, you know, and yeah. the stories were short because 
it, it, that was when Strange Tales was still a combo book. And I, I right. think Johnny Storm as the, the partner. Yeah, for most of it. Yeah, for, and, and so a lot of the stories are only 12, 16 pages long. Yeah. And, and it's just really great. It, it's, and, and it's hilarious when um, Roy Thomas comes in because he clearly like shuts down entire plot lines. <laughs> he wraps up like the whole Doctor Strange two-year plot. He basically wraps up in one page. <laughs> and he, and he can get on with, uh, with, with, with the Cleo plot, which is what he really wants to tell. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. Actually, Roy Thomas does that on Doctor Strange twice. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's great. Does he have to yeah. cut like somebody else takes over in the meantime and he comes back? Um, he he also took over the book after the whole um, Strange Tales where um, he was sharing the book with Cloak and Dagger. Oh, okay. No, I know that book. Yeah, you're talking about the Jackson Geis. Yeah, yeah, because Roy Thomas was writing that. I loved that series. Yeah. That was great. Because because uh, I remember the opening panel, the opening splash page was Strange with his shirt off, and yep. he was muscular and buff, and that was telling yep. you right off in the very first, like we're gonna have a physical Doctor Strange, and he gets in a martial arts contest with Wong, yep. and then he has to fight Mobius, the living vampire, who claws his neck so he can't talk, yeah, he can't speak any spells, so he has to defeat Mobius, the living vampire, using kung fu. And I was like, I, I love this book. Like, this is the best book ever. But that was that was another book where you know pretty much every all the events and setup from the previous like three years, uh, Thomas undid it in like two pages. <laughs> yeah. love and as a, as an aside, we have uh, Mike Lafferty just joined us. Mike, you Mike. there? Hey guys, how you doing? Great. How, how are you doing? Talking about you. Uh, I, good things. I hope good things. So. Um, <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Uh, where are we at? Have we covered all the important stuff? And we're done. Let's wrap it up now. Well, no, we, we're done. We, okay. we, uh, we'd covered our reactions to the movies. If you would like to weigh in, tell us what you thought of it. Yeah. Um. Well, I'm probably gonna say stuff you guys have already said, but just not it anyway. Your uh, show, go for it. Inimitable drunken style. Uh, um. I saw it twice. Uh. Once with my dad and once with my wife because uh, she wanted to see it really bad. So, um. It was good in IMAX. Um. Uh, the visuals really made it. Um, obviously, I think there's a you know you're gonna make, make a comparison to Inception. Um, mm -hmm. Like with Thor, I was amazed they did it as well as they did because it's a character that would seem to be hard to translate uh, cinematically. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, I really like the after credit scenes. Yeah. Oh right. yeah. Yeah. Did everybody notice his gloves in the after credits? Yes, scene? I love that. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you, you didn't you see it on a 60-foot screen? <laughs> I, I, well, I, was, I, I suspect was, what they did was they shot the, the credit scene before they did the rest of the movie, and they took the gloves off for the film because they thought that it was too much. Mm -hmm. But he's wearing Doctor Strange's gloves. But he's wearing the orange gloves, yeah. Huh, I didn't notice that. Oh, yep. okay. Well, I was drinking too, so at least. <laughs> I told you, <laughs> style. <laughs> nice. Oh, the yeah, okay, all right, yeah. The oh, but when you, when you say that, um, when you say that you didn't think it would translate, I think what you were getting at there is is the fantasy, the magic aspect of it. Uh, yeah, because it, it's hard to do right, and it's hard to do without. You, I mean, you don't want to step in the footsteps of some other famous franchises that have recently had, you know, sorcerers on the screen. You know, you don't want to people say, oh, it's Harry Potter. You know, you I, know? I, will, I will freely admit when it opened with evil sorcerers running down the streets of London, I, 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 I nudged my wife and said, somebody call the Ministry of Magic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it, it, there is kind of that vibe, yeah. Oh, hey, you know, we should do a giveaway on this podcast because um, how popular was the last giveaway, Walt? Did you get any responses? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, and uh, I'm just, uh, I, I was going to talk to you about it uh, once you got back from vacation about uh, who you wanted to uh, hand that out to because we got about seven responses. So okay. uh, pretty good for a first one. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, let's, let's do a giveaway for this podcast. For anyone who's been patient enough to listen through to the almost hour mark, um, we'll give away books of magic from Book of Magic from Green Ronin from Unison Masterminds, um, written by a bunch of clever fellas, including Mr. Steve Kenson, who is with us today. Yes, pretty much my love letter to the whole concept of Dr. Strange. Yeah. yeah. So um, what's, the, what's the email for that? Do you want to use your, your email or my email for this, uh, Walt? No, that's fine. You can use mine. Uh, it's uh, supers. CBR 
at gmail.com. Okay, and, and just put um, Dr. Strange in the subject line, and you'll be entered in the uh, raffle for the giveaway for this PDF, which uh, it's an awesome book too. A couple years old, but it's real out of cool stuff in there. So, has anyone has anyone ever done like an all wizards campaign, like supers campaign, like super wizards game, like a Doctor Strange kind of campaign? The the last the last use most minds campaign I did, technically speaking, was using the Supernatural Handbook for third edition. So it, it was mm, nice. purely based around um, uh, Freedom City and the magic user guys in that. You know, yes. Mm. How did it and, go? Uh, yeah, good, pretty cool. It was eight, I had two players, so it was quite it was quite cool because it was they were it, I I said to him it's it's a cross between um, the X Files and and you know Harry Potter, so it's like Ooh. they had some some monsters come in, there'd be stuff like this, and just regular bad guys and the magical bad guys, and oh my god, what's the guy? The first bad guy they came across was the uh, I want to say the eight eightfold web. Oh yeah, the the, 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 the spider chap. The, yeah, yeah. yeah, they they basically fought a massive amount of spiders and a guy that uh, transformed himself into a giant um, kind of giant spider in front of their eyes. So that was quite cool. Yeah. Speaking of magic and superheroes, did you guys see uh, uh, the Justice League Dark uh, images coming out? Yes, mm -hmm. I've seen the trailer for it. John Const I've Constantine, to me, doesn't sound right. He said, "He says bugger off in it, and they, they don't. They didn't say bugger off like that the right way." So, <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed it had Batman in it. It's it's got most of the Justice League in it, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. I, I I thought it would just be like the I I was expecting all of the mystical characters in the Justice League Dark comic rather it's, than rather than Batman. Dead mm -hmm. Dead Dead Man Satana. Constantine Swamp Thing, I think, are the key people yeah. in it. I don't know, is anybody else? Okay. Well, but yeah, I, I just, Swamp but, Thing. But in the comic, Batman was not a member of the team, right? So there's a marketing issue going on here. Like, we have to make sure people watch it, so let's put Batman in it. Yeah, we they have, have to recognize like, the character in it. That's true. It, it, they it's have kind to of, call him in, yeah. It, it's kind of the DC version of, hey, what's Wolverine doing right. here? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Hey, have we already talked about the clever ending of the movie? I did. Yes, we did, actually. Uh, we were big fans of the clever ending of the movie. Yeah, that was one thing we were talking about when we left was, you know, usually Marvel movies kind of wrap up with, uh, you know, e either a lot of dramatical angst or a lot of punching. And uh, this one, I think, as you said in your blog post, uh, Jason, yeah. had more of a Doctor Who ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, we, we did. We talked about it, and I'm glad that you liked it. And did you go and see it with your wife? I did. Yeah. Did she like the ending? Did she feel let down? Was it anticlimactic or anything? Uh, no, she thought it was cool. She's a big Doctor Who fan, though, so that might be why. Mm, could be. And and you know another thing that, about about that ending, you know, that's an ending that only works if you really, really, really care about those characters. And mm -hmm. credit to the actors for making us like that ending. Yeah, you're right. If we didn't care about Doctor Strange, the fact that he's getting killed every two minutes, yeah, potentially for yeah. eternity. Uh, yeah. Would only be a funny gag, you know. And right. we're ho we're hoping he'll he'll resurrect Wong, and yeah. you know, well, yeah. Well, yeah right. and, you know, and one of the other sort of key elements about that ending, in addition to it being clever, was the fact that it was such a heroic sacrifice. Yeah, you know, because Strange didn't know that was going to work, right? Um, and you know, he was basically willing to, you know, essentially exile himself to an eternity in hell, you know, in order to protect the world. Uh, and I think that was sort of a key formative moment for his yeah. character. Yeah, so yeah. often these movies end with um, you. the hero has created an object of power which the villain is now using. Yeah. Right? Or, or something. And so the hero has to destroy it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't have to destroy the, Magu the MacGuffin this episode. Uh, right. Yeah. And I, yeah. It was, I would love to have seen how that ending got written. Like where... Where did they have to pitch that ending mm -hmm. to convince somebody that we could end the movie without a slugfest? Yeah. Or was well, it always... I, guess, I still... Anybody, been, anybody been watching Rick and Morty other than me? My nobody. Philistines. I'm more of a Squidbillies guy. Sorry. <laughs> All right. No, they, they brought in Dan Harmon, who was uh, head writer on Community, mm -hmm. head writer on 
Rick and Morty. And if you, he's got a and d game on CISO right now, you can oh, check nice. out. And uh, yeah, they brought him in to do uh, Punch Up. So I don't know if the ending was his idea, but that kind of reminded me of a couple different Rick and Morty ideas that have been floating around. But um, mm-hmm. and, and I think yeah. I interrupted Steve. I'm sorry, Steve. Please go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know, but I suspect the original seed of how the ending got written that way was based on the original yeah. comic book story. Yeah. You know, at the very least, you know, the notion that, that Strange defeats Dormammu in their first conflict by tricking him, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, the bargain is the same. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, and the fact that, that they do, you know, essentially, you know, he gets Dormammu to agree to, a, you know, a bargain because that's the only thing that can really restrain him. Yeah. I, you know, random thought about about the ending. I just this just literally just popped in my head. Do you think the public awareness of films like Harry Potter, where the where the film doesn't always end with a big punch em out? Do you think Do you think Marvel felt more confident going with that ending, given that you know other franchises have succeeded with doing that sort of thing? Possibly. I mean, it's it's it can be argued, you know, and many people have said that you know all the Marvel movies are basically you know superheroes plus another genre yeah. <laughs> you know i mean and so you know if dr strange is basically superheroes plus you know modern magic movies like harry potter it wouldn't be surprising to see some elements reflected in that yeah and, and yeah. i tell you, i tell you, I'm, I'm going to see a uh, fantastic beast saturday morning yeah and i'm kind of i i, I it, having strange so fresh in my mind i think it's going to be kind of an interesting comparison just to see you know the different tones the different approaches to it all mm. How do you guys feel uh, different, different approaches in gaming uh, uh, with regards to magic as far as, like, the superhero goes? Because, well, I mean, the old Marvel was, uh, was you just called it magic, pretty much, wasn't it? <laughs> that you just had certain powers? Yeah. I think Jason wanted to... Check. I just wanted to note that, that uh, well, first, uh, the that Realms of Magic book that we've already been gushing about, the old uh, 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 Marvel one, it had a, it divided magic up into like various sources of power, right? So you could mm-hmm. call on people and you would get spells based on a person, or you could have like use your own personal power, uh, or you could sort of summon the ambient magic of the universe. And I remember the book split up into those different chapters and all the different kinds of effects you could do with each of those things. And it made it, it, it applied a logic to magic without mm-hmm. taking away all of magic's coolness. Yeah. But but the book that I played with the most wasn't Realms of Magic. It was, I think it was called Mystic Hero. Do I have the right name for that? I think it was Dean Shom, Dean oh, oh, yeah, yeah, the Champions one. The Champions yeah. one. Yep. And, and that's why I asked about a campaign, because I played in a campaign that went about, I don't know, nine or ten months. Mm-hmm. And we all made wizards using those rules, so we were playing with magic using characters um, uh, in the champion setting. Yep. And, and usually the, the challenge, and the reason why I asked kind of aid how that game had played out, was because if you tell your players, okay, like everybody has to be magic, th- there can be a feeling like, well, then we're all going to be the same. And, and overcoming that and showing how, well, no, like you don't. Like you can, there's a million things you can do. Uh, can be very freeing to the players, but there can be a lot of resistance up front. Mm. Well, it's not really a normal, you don't see that often in supergroups. I mean, Shadow Pact or Justice League Dark are mm-hmm. the only two I can, I can think of. But I mean, um, most of you guys ways, are in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also had a little bit of that at when, like, especially like when Steve Gerber was writing the Defenders. Yes. And and David David Anthony Kraft, who came in after him. Uh, you know that that always said well. Even, even well, Doctor Strange was in the team, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, I, I yeah, you saw a little bit of that there too. I, I think that in many ways, um, an all magic group might work better at the game table than on the on the comics page. I, I don't know, <laughs> but people don't seem too willing to buy into an all magic team. Yeah. Uh, on the comics page, but but players can get into it, um, mm-hmm. and I think. Oh, you know, please go ahead. I was gonna say that the, the the only time I can think that they, apart from the two two that Mike just said, was when we had the nineties stuff with the Dark Hold and the Ghost Rider stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah they right. were technically the Midnight Suns. Based. Yeah, exactly. Magic. That's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. they were all magic based. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. That's part and, of the sort of ugly, dark and gritty nineties, right? Oh, of yes, course. Indeed. 
And hey, oh, while, guys, we're play, while we're plugging comics, yeah. let, me do, let me do a shout out for my favorite mystically orientated book of all time. Uh, John Ostrander and Tom Mandrick's run on the Spectre. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that reminds me. Did you guys see Dr. Fate was canceled? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah that's a bummer. I didn't even know there was a Dr. Fate. What? What? Oh, you mean the book? The ongoing yeah. comic? Yeah. Oh, okay. The real Dr. Fate, those in Blue Beetle. Yeah. So, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Are we done? Well, I was gonna. I was gonna ask. Sorry, uh, Sorry. I, I just killed killed it dead. <laughs> Good job, Ed. <laughs> All right. If we're, if we're looking for random stuff, I have to I have to point out that the Mystic Hero book that uh, Jason just plugged has maybe my all time favorite available superhero perk. Correct me if I'm, Jason may remember this better than I do, but I mm. seem to recall that like for ten points, you can buy the advantage deity. <laughs> and you, you get you, you get like a you basically become like a Dormammu type character. You have like a pocket dimension where everybody worships you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice work if you can get it. It may yeah. have been more like it may have been fifteen points, but yeah, you could totally do that, Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, it, it seemed underpriced for deity. That. <laughs> but there's always been a long ongoing joke in Champions that if you get if you get two points, you can buy fast draw. Uh, you can raise your con by one, or you can buy immortal. <laughs> uh, because you can buy unaging. Uh, yeah. You got these these three cowboys sitting around the far uh, the fire, comparing how they spent their XP. Mm-hmm. And one guy says, "Oh yeah, and I bought Immortal." <laughs> and, you, yeah, so there was a lot of weird sort of point scale things about mm-hmm. champions. You you, you like, remind me of the strangest, most fun conversation I've had at Gen Con in ages. Good. I had I had dinner with Darren Watts, yeah. you know, our, our friend friend of the podcast, yeah. and he he had spent all day asking various game designer friends of his, like Ken Height and for and so forth. If you in real life had three champions character points to spend, what would you buy? <laughs> and Darren was making this argument for you had to be careful because, like, if you bought something truly super, you'd probably wind up you know getting dissected in a lab somewhere, and you couldn't defend yourself with only three points. Exactly. Right. So he made an argument of you should take that and dump it into swimming because apparently three points in swimming makes you faster than Michael Phelps. Yeah. It does. So you could you could enter the Olympics and then live off the endorsements the rest of your life. <laughs> nice. That's a fair argument to be made. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can now sense the next uh, plot of the uh, next Aquaman series. That's gonna <laughs> so it's going to be. Yep, I'm giving up superhero in. Like, right. <laughs> we should have Dan Abnett back on. Ask him about say, that. So, anybody else reading Dan, Dan Abnett's Aquaman book? It's actually quite good. Yeah. yeah I, 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 been reading reading it, I love the character, but I haven't read it. Yeah. It's, it's my favorite monthly book uh, after Squirrel Girl. Yeah, it's been quite good. I enjoyed it. Now, if is you're it- not reading Squirrel Girl, you should read Squirrel Girl. <laughs> Now, has everybody seen the video of uh, Khal Drogo slash Aquaman uh, throwing axes while drinking a Viking-sized tankard of beer? <laughs> He's going to be the it. best thing to happen in Aquaman since ever. <laughs> He's going to make that character so popular. Like, whoever decided to cast him, that, that person alone, like, deserves my undying love. <laughs> hmm. I just I just really enjoy the scene in the, in the trailer where, you know... Um, uh, Bruce Wayne is is getting that whole spiel about you know the King's Tide and you know talking him up, and rather than this wordy answer that you would expect from royalty, he just turns around and he's like, "Talk." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you haven't seen that video of Jason Momoa throwing axes while drinking beer, yeah. in his oh my god, it's it's hysterical. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'm from rural Virginia. We call that Saturday night. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's definitely going to partake a little of the uh, you know sort of savage sort of Atlantis you know approach yeah. to things. Nice. Do they do they have that? Uh, like, um, I'm not a big Aquaman reader, so um, do, do they have the in the new uh, in the new series? Uh, do they have that sense of um, like mystical artifacts and stuff like that, like the trident and, and all that? Yeah, there's some of that, but it's it's actually you know way more. Uh, it's much slicker in the new series, and it's it's actually a lot more focused on. Um, uh, it's almost like Aquaman, you know, like Atlant the Atlantean version of West Wing. Yeah, um, I, I could go with that. Yeah, 
You nice. Know? Um, and it's really a lot about, you know, the fact that, you know, Aquaman really is king of an actual country that has, and he has, you know, like a court and, you know, um, you know, general of his army and, you know, uh, you know, a, a seneschal and all of these other people who, you know, keep Atlantis running essentially. Um, and who are, who are super protective of him, of course, because he's the king. Um, and, you know, are constantly frustrated by the fact that he goes off and does things like, you know, fight the shaggy man, you know, without asking them first. <laughs> that was a pretty good fight. Yeah, right. <laughs> I actually have the entire ser- new series in my comicsology queue. I just haven't had the time to read it yet because uh, Mike had uh, interviewed Dan Abnett on the show and then uh, then suggested the series. So I'm looking forward to reading it. I just got to get the five minutes. to. Yeah, it's well worth checking out. And a super nice That's guy. Awesome. You really, really like to see a guy like that succeed. He is. He is. He is so nice and so patient with all of my ridiculous questions about my dissertation. <laughs> You're talking <laughs> Aquaman or uh, Dan Abnett? <laughs> I, I really hope they're giving Abnett a little piece of the Guardians of the Galaxy because uh, that whole iteration of the team was all him. And I saw it very him. much him. Yeah. He didn't get mentioned in the credits, and if, if he was getting any money, they would have mentioned it in the credits. No, oh, that's. Yeah. It would have been based on characters by or something. Yeah, he was very influential on that. Yeah, I, I had not watched that movie a second time because I was afraid it wouldn't hold up to repeat viewing. But um, I wound up having to see it this weekend, and I was pleasantly surprised. It was uh, still a pretty good time. I'm going to have to go watch it again, now that you reminded me of it. It was a pretty fun movie. Yeah, and the trailer um, has me excited for the orig- for the sequel. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I, I was I, I was surprised because I think I, like I might have mentioned to uh, Chris on a recent podcast, like there's some movies I don't want to watch twice because like the new Star Wars movie, really enjoyed it. Afraid if I watch the second time, I'll start analyzing it. And that's not going to go anywhere. Good. <laughs> Very delicate. You don't want to mess with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had a good time with it. I don't want to be the guy who's like, well, actually, it should be like this or what were they thinking? You know, just enjoy it for what it is and walk away. Don't be a dick, a dick about it. But um. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy. I could watch it twice. I was like, yeah, that was still an enjoyable movie. I mean, it's mm-hmm. not a, uh, it's not Dune, but I wasn't looking for Dune. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, apparently, I was Brad Mc, Bradley McDivitt was posting on Facebook. He's been watching the Disney cartoon, which I'm kind of can take or leave. Usually, I haven't seen this one, but apparently, they got a bunch of old '70s funk on the soundtrack for this cartoon. Nice. Huh. Yeah. Sweet. There's some Ugashaka there too. Might be worth checking out. Yeah. <laughs> So we have just passed the hour mark. Do we want to go ahead and wrap up? Is there anything else you want to cover? I'm pretty good. Uh, okay. Don't forget the giveaway again. Oh, yeah, the giveaway. Um, what's the email address, Walt? Supercbr at gmail.com. And we'll be giving away a copy of the PDF, Mutant Semester Minds Book of Magic. And um, please uh, post about our podcast on your social media. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell your uh, family members you're going to see on Thanksgiving while you're not talking about politics. <laughs> who wants to talk about politics right now? Yeah, why would we talk about politics? There's nothing going on, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for talking about politics, just I don't think maybe this particular episode is the right one. But um, <laughs> I was very happy to just watch a movie. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A movie yeah. about faith. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying politics has no place in gaming because I think it does. I just, um, uh, uh, damn! I wish I hadn't brought up the subject. Now, like <laughs> just I hate to meme on you real quick, but you know, you know, they should really add more politics to that. Said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, nobody ever says uh, the two things we never talk about are beer and pizza. You know, so I mean. <laughs> Well, it, it's obviously a divisive time for our country, and there's a lot of serious issues that you know we're talking about, and gaming is a good form for talking about them. Um, but yeah, when I have turkey with my with my dad uh, in a little bit, I'm not, I'm going to stay the fuck away from the presidential election. <laughs> and maybe I'll argue with him in December. Maybe I'll argue with him in January. But I'm just going to try to get through a meal without you know calling him a proto fascist. That's my goal, and I believe I can do it. <laughs> That's a good goal, Mike. I believe in that goal. Yeah. I'd like to. Thank well, you. maybe Thank can can I can I pass along a survival tip? Yes, please. Whenever my family try to draw, well, actually, well, well, I've used this outside of family. Whenever somebody tries to uh, drag me into a uh, political discussion, I always segue into a discussion of, of like nineteenth century politics. I'll just I'll just look at them straight in the eye and go, "Yes, reminds me of the John Tyler administration." <laughs> <laughs>
and that will <laughs> kill political discussions better than a 45 to the skull. <laughs> but let's talk about Martin Van Buren a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's something to use. Yeah, how about that bimetallism? Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, um, switching topics. Have you guys heard of this new Mutants and Masterminds forum, Echoes of the Multiverse? Yeah, it started by fans, right? Yeah, it goes to the multiverse.com. It's a new mutants and masterminds uh, forum. So, cool. yeah, let's just give it a plug. It's out there. If you want to talk about mutants and masterminds, now you have a new place to do it. So, yeah, just wanted to mention it. Um, anything else we want to cover before we wrap up? Uh, Shambhala is the password. <laughs> Shambhala is the password. Right. Has anyone else already remarked upon the similarity between Doctor Strange movie and the first Iron Man movie in terms of origin stories? <laughs> Seen a bit of that online, yeah. Yeah, okay. a little bit. We actually were talking about how, uh, you know, in many ways it was, you know, an even better Green Lantern movie. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. I can see that completely. Mm. Wow. I would, now, now I'm wishing it was a Green Lantern movie. <laughs> right? You don't know what I would give for a good, good Green Lantern movie. That would, uh, wow. You know, well, Mortal we, Sinestro, Ancient One is the Guardians. You we, know. We, we just need a bus to hit Z Zack Snyder. <laughs> oh yeah, the the after credit scene with uh, Mordru and the after credit mm -hmm. scene with Sinestro. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Okay. Damn. <laughs> I, I I had missed that. Think about that for a bit. You have a good point, sir. Wow, you're staggering from being hit with that clue by four. <laughs> yeah, I, I am still seeing stars. So. <laughs> All right. Anything else, anybody? No. I think we're good. All good. All right, cool. Well, thanks for tuning in to the Banff Podcast. Don't forget our giveaway, and uh, we'll see you next time.